now we'll do some theory question. And this would be related to shapes, the first one shapes of molecules, right? So uh, let's do the theory, let's do some theory past paper questions related to shapes. Uh, the first one is you're supposed to uh, tell the shape of an ALCL3, an ALCL3 molecule. So what's the shape of ALCL3 molecule? Uh, make sure you know how many bonds it's got. It's got three bonds and there, there are no lone pairs for this. Uh, whenever an atom has three bonds, uh, the shape of the molecule is, one second, let me add people. So whenever an atom has three bonds, uh, we did shapes over here. So whenever, whenever an atom has three bonds, the shape of the molecule is going to be trigonal planar and the angle would be 120 degrees. But you have to make sure that it's got no lone pairs. Uh, aluminum just has three electrons. So one shared over here, one shared over here, one shared over here. So there is nothing that is left. So ALCL3, uh, the shape is going to be trigonal planar. It's going to be a completely planar molecule. And the angles, so trigonal planar. and the angles are going to be 120 degrees. Uh, what about PCL3? Now, phosphorus is in group five. When it's in group five, that means uh, phosphorus is making three bonds with CLs. So there's going to be some electrons that would be left. Phosphorus is in group five, so that means three electrons shared. So there are actually two electrons that are left. So you've got one lone pair and three bonds. Now the shape of such a molecule is uh, basically you've got, uh, it's going to be, it's going to be this one, just a second. Okay, so it's going to be this one. It's, it's a shape that's derived from a tetrahedral shape. You've got four electron densities, except that on one side, there's a lone pair. So the top is missing, uh, but you've got electrons there, but there's nothing attached on that side. So it's going to be trigonal pyramidal. In a tetrahedral shape, you just have four bonds. So the angles are 109.5, but the lone pair that's sitting on top over here in uh, in uh, uh, in our case, uh, that is going to exert a greater repulsion. So the angle kind of shrinks 207 degrees. So PCL3 is going to be trigonal pyramidal. So one bond coming towards you, one bond going into the page, and there's going to be a lone pair that would be sitting on top. And the angles would be 107 degrees. So this one is trigonal pyramidal. Uh, now the next one is, uh, you're now being asked to draw the shapes uh, of the molecules of uh, SO3 and so SO3. Again, remember SO3, sulfur has six electrons, oxygen makes double bonds. So it's basically three double bonds. Plus there would be no lone pairs. All the six electrons of sulfur are getting used up. So no lone pairs over here. So this would be fan-shaped trigonal planar again. And all our angles would be 100, 120 degrees. Uh, then you've got oxen with two seals. Now oxen is bonded to uh, two seals. So when it's bonded to two seals, uh, let me drop this. So when it's bonded to two seals, oxen is in group six. So count the lone pairs. It's got six electrons in its valence shell. So two are getting shared. So that means there are four electrons that are left. So it's going to have it's going to have four lone pairs. So the shape is going to be derived from a tetrahedral shape, uh, which is uh, which is this one. Uh, but on two sides, there's going to be CL, and on the other two sides, uh, there's just going to be lone pairs that would be sitting on those sides. There would be no atoms on that side, so they would not be counted in the shape because there's nothing on that side except for for lone pairs or orbitals. Uh, so the angle would have been 109.5, but it's going to shrink to 104.5 because of the extra repulsion of the lone pairs. And uh, it's going to be bent. The shape is going to be bent or non-linear or V-shaped. 
So it's going to be bent. You can call it nonlinear, or you can also call it V-shaped. So just two bonds, and uh, and you don't have to actually show these things when you write when you draw the shape. Next one is uh, use drawn in cross, cross diagram. Uh, to show the shape of the ammonium ion, show the outer electrons only. Use the following code for your electrons. Uh, this is something we didn't we didn't do dative bonding, so I'll just quickly uh, recap what dative bonding is. As the last thing we had covered was intermolecular forces. So I'm going to start over here. Dative bonding is simple: that atoms have lone pairs in the outer shells. So he's talking about the ammonium ion. So a dative bond or a coordinate bond, also known as a coordinate bond, is something or a dative covalent bond or a coordinate bond. Now, that is when both electrons that are shared, they are provided, they come from the same atom. So for example, NH3 over here has a lone pair. It's got five electrons. That means uh, two electrons are not out of the five. Two electrons are not getting used uh, in bonding over here. Uh, so N has the outer electronic configuration of N is uh, it's 2s2, 2px1. It's got 2py1 and there is 2pz1. So it needs electrons in three of the orbitals. So it attracts eight atoms uh, to give it electrons in three of the orbitals. One of the orbital is already full. So that is uh, not going to be involved in uh, bonding initially because it doesn't need, it does, this one doesn't need any electrons. So it's a lone pair. Uh, but if somebody needs those electrons, like if there's an H plus one ion that's roaming around, H plus one is completely empty. It's got a completely empty shell, a completely empty subshell as well. It's got one as zero, no electrons, it needs electrons. So what it would do is it's going to form a dative bond, uh, the electrons over here will be attracted to the H plus one, which is uh, completely electron deficient. And a dative bond is represented by an arrow. And that's what's going to happen. So whenever you have an empty orbital and you have a completely full orbital or a, or a lone pair on the other atom, a dative bond can be formed. So there are many instances uh, where this could happen, possibly happen. So for example, uh, if you've got water molecules, these water molecules also have these uh, lone pairs. I mean, oxen has two lone pairs. Like if you write the electronic configuration of oxen, two of its orbitals are completely full. Uh, two of them need electrons in them. So oxen normally forms two bonds, but it's got these orbitals that are completely full that don't need electrons from anyone because they already are completely packed with electrons. So they might be, so there might be uh, an H plus one that would be roaming around and that H plus one would be attracted to the lone pairs over here. So that's known as a dative covalent bond. Uh, the arrow direction shows the lone pair getting attracted to the H plus one. So H plus one will be sticking to these lone pairs and they would be sharing electrons. So it's like a, it's like a normal covalent bond except that both electrons are provided by the same atom. So there are many, many instances. For example, you have uh, AlCl3 with the, uh, let's do it with NH3. They could, they could form a dative bond with each other because uh, normally Al forms three bonds because it only has three electrons in its outer shell. But Al has a completely empty orbital in its outer shell. Like aluminium's electronic configuration, its outer shell group three is 
uh, it's got an S subshell and PX and a PY and a PZ. But it's got only three electrons. So one over here, one over here, one over here. The third orbital is completely empty. When aluminum, aluminum bonds with three chlorine atoms, uh, these electrons, these orbitals get filled up. So this is filled up, this is filled up, this is filled up. Except that the last one is still completely empty. So that means there's a space available and aluminium's octet is still not complete. It needs two electrons over here as well. So if there's an NH3 molecule that's roaming around and we already discussed that the NH3 molecule has these lone pairs. So the lone pairs of N will be attracted to the aluminium and both atoms would try to share those electrons. So plenty of areas where uh, dative bonding happens. Uh, for example, uh, and there's a dimerization of ALCL3 that is also very important. That's in your syllabus. It's uh, This is when two ALCL3 molecules And here's another ALCL3 molecule. So remember, aluminium has just three electrons. So that means uh, the fourth orbital in its uh, outer shell is completely empty. So this orbital over here is empty. Aluminium's orbital over here is empty. Cl, on the other hand, has plenty of lone pairs. It's got, it's got three of them. I mean, out of the seven electrons, uh, only three of them get used up. Uh, uh, sorry, three of them are completely empty. CL's electronic configuration is, it's the third shell, the 3S completely full, the 3PX is also full, the 3PY is also full. The 3PC is the one that just needs one electron. So CL normally forms one bond, but it's capable of forming many dative bonds because uh, it's got lots, it's, it's got, Plenty of lone pairs. So CL's lone pairs are going to get attracted to aluminium. This CL's lone pair are going to get attracted to aluminium and they would form a dimer. An ALCL3 molecule will dimerize. A dimer is like a polymer. Polymer is many molecules join up. Dimer is when just di means just two. So they're going to form AL2CL6. So whenever an atom has a completely empty orbital and the other one has a lone pair that is a completely full orbital, uh, the lone pairs of one atom can be attracted to the empty, completely empty orbital of the other atom and they can start sharing electrons. Just like what happened in NS3. Is this clear? Date of covalent bonds. Yes or no? Is this clear? Abdullah, is this clear, Isa? Yes, sir. So, so we have to show what an ammonium ion uh, is. And he's saying use the following code for the electrons. Uh, they're just asking for the dot and cross diagram. So what you're going to show is that there's going to be an N. Uh, normally, it just bonds with three H atoms. So here's another H atom. And uh, N has two spare electrons, two lone pairs. Out of the five, three of them bond. But in the case of uh, a data bond formation, an H plus one ion is completely empty. So a completely empty H plus one ion is going to get attracted to the two lone pairs over here. So the overall charge on this entire thing is going to be plus one. Uh, so they had, they were specifically asking for the dot and cross diagram. Otherwise you could have shown it like this, that it's going to be three NH3s and there's a lone pair and the H plus one is getting attracted to those lone pairs. And remember the charge is going to be on the entire ion. And now he's asking for the shape of an ammonium ion and give the H NH bond angle. So basically a dative bond is just like a covalent bond. So it's got four bonds. When you've got four bonds, the shape is going to be tetra. It's going to be tetrahedral. With the, I mean, you can have the dative bond on top. 
So the actual shape would look something like this. It's going to be tetrahedral and the angles are going to be 109.5 degrees. Okay, that's what your uh, shape would be. Next one is we've got hydrogen sulfide. Uh, so draw the Dorian cross diagram and predict the shape. Uh, so, I mean, the Dorian cross diagram sulfur is group six. Uh, group six, they're just going to form two bonds with H. So sulfur has a total of around it. It's got two lone pairs and two bonds. So again, it's a shape that's derived from a tetra Hedral arrangement, except that only on two sides do we have H atoms. On the other two sides, you got you got lone pairs. So the shape is just bent, or V-shaped, or non-linear. And the angle would be because there's nothing on this side. Uh, the angle would be it would have been 109.5, but because of the extra lone pair repulsion, the angle is 104.5 degrees. Uh, this time we, he's he's asking us to draw uh, the three-dimensional shape of an ammonia molecule. We already did that. To the sh show the shape of a hydrazine molecule, I said they. I said this is part of a question. They must have given us the formula of hydrazine. It is N2H4. So basically, it's a uh, two ends bonded to each other and. N makes three bonds. Each of the N atom would have lone pairs. So each of the N is three bonds with one lone pair. So the shape around the N would be would be something like this with a lone pair that's sitting on top. So around this N, three bonds and one lone pair. I mean, it would have been tetrahedral had there been something at the top, but there's nothing on the top. There's just a lone pair. So this end over here is bonded to two H atoms. And on one side, there's a nitrogen atom. And that nitrogen is also the same. It's got, so I'm going to make an inverted pyramid now. So this one is bonded to two H atoms. And there's a lone pair on top. So it's like two pyramids connected to each other. This end is going to be pyramidal and this end would also be pyramidal and all the angles would be 107 degrees. And it would be trigonal. Trigonal pyramidal. I so said we can forget that. Uh, the SF6 molecule, if you have Six bonds, the shape is all the bonds are going to repel each other. So it's going to be one or one would be on top, one would be at the bottom, one on the right side, one on the left side. One F would be behind the sulfur and one F would be coming out of the page in front of the sulfur. So all the angles would be 90 degrees and the shape is going to be called an octahedral arrangement or shape. So that is that is an SF6 molecule. So we're going to stop with the shapes for a while. We can try and do this one. Uh, I've got S4, N4. He's saying sulfur forms, assuming all bonds, bonds shown are single bonds, uh, determine the number of lone pairs of electrons around an atom. So you have to determine or figure out the lone pairs. N has five electrons, one shared over here, one has been shared over here, so you're left with three electrons. Sulfur has a total of six electrons. One shared over here, one shared over here, so you're left with four electrons. So around the sulfur, you've got two lone pairs. Around the N, you just have one lone pair. There's, there's one orbital that still needs electrons. It's not completely paired. So in total around N, there's just one lone pair. Lone pair means a complete pair. Every orbital has two electrons. So there's just going to be one orbital with two electrons. The other one is still uh, in need of an electron. 
And now he's saying which bond A or B molecule will be smaller. So is, this is B basically. So if you have more lone pairs, there's going to be more repulsion. Uh, that would result in more repulsion. The lone pairs are going to push the bonds further away from them. Uh, valence shell electron pair repulsion theory, and uh, which is why A is going to be smaller. Over here, the, the electrons over here are going to repel the bonds, but they're fewer electrons. So the reason is A is going to be smaller. And the simple reason is there are more lone pairs. So there's going to be greater repulsion. Uh, of the bonds due to those uh, greater number of lone pairs. So the bonds would be kind of closer to each other. Uh, again, SS6, PCL5, remember PCL5, that's a different shape that usually never comes. Uh, this is probably the only question where they were asking for PCL5. So PCL5 looks something like this. Let me just find the shape of a PCL5 molecule. Just one second, let the board load. So a PCL5 molecule would be this one. Five bonds, the shape is going to be trigonal by pyramidal and uh, it's like a fan in the middle. Three bonds, like a fan, repelling each other. The angles between the fans are 120 degrees. And you're going to have one bond sticking on top of the fan, one hanging at the bottom of the fan. Those bonds would be making angles of 90 degrees. So there would be two types of angles. And uh, between the fans, the angles are 120 degrees. The one on top, one at the bottom, that's uh, that would be 90 degrees. So coming back to this, the shape is trigonal bipyramidal. Just a second. So the shape is trigonal bipyramidal. I think it's B I. One of the angles is 90 degrees. The other one is 120 degrees. So there are going to be two types of angles if you've got five bonds. And beyond that, you usually don't uh, get questions. Uh, but remember, PCL5 will have other derivative shapes as well. For example, uh, I mean, the same electron densities, like uh, a total of five electron densities, you might have lone pairs on one side. So for example, uh, a PCL5 molecule might have, and let me draw those shapes, or not PCL5, but it could be some other molecule, let's call it X. And instead, it's going to be fan-shaped in the middle Three of the bonds would be fan shaped and there would be one bond sitting on top, one hanging at the bottom of the fan. Now you could have atoms bonded to these three sides. And instead over here, there would be a lone pair. This is known as a seesaw shape. As so these shapes have never actually come in your exams, uh, but so was PCL5, it, that was never uh, uh, asked in your exams. Uh, the other ones are, uh, you could have three lone pairs and two bonds. That would be just a linear shape. Like, uh, like you could have the same shape. There could be an atom over here. And there could be a fan-shaped, three bonds would be fan-shaped. And there could be one bond on top of the fan and one at the bottom of the fan. So what you could have is, uh, there could be an atom bonded over here, an atom bonded over here. And on all these three sides, there could be lone pairs instead of an actual atom bonded to it. So the fan will not count because there's nothing attached to the fan. So it's like it's like a fan with no blades. So there's nothing here. So this shape would just be Y, X, and Y. It would be a linear shape. 
and there would be one more which is which is going to be t shaped uh, a t shaped shape is uh, so these are derivative shapes of the same uh, five electron density that would be that you're going to have again uh, the middle part fan shaped and one bond on top and one at the bottom of the fan in t shaped uh, you got two sides there lone pairs and there's an atom attached over here, an atom attached over here, and an atom that is attached at the bottom. So two of the blades of the, of the fans in the middle have nothing attached to them. They've just got lone pairs. So this shape uh, would be T-shaped. So you're going to have a linear shape, a T-shaped, or a seesaw shape. They, these shapes would be derived from this trigonal bipyramidal shape. So... So this is not important, no need to remember this, but if you have time, try and remember this might actually come in your exams. Uh, so, so let's uh, move to, uh, so let's ignore shapes for a second. Let's try and do these bond strength questions. Take it just one second. Now, uh, about bond strength, uh, the simple idea is you've got two types of bonds generally. Uh, you've got uh, bonds that depend on ions and bonds that are covalently bonded to each other. So when you have a covalent bond, the rule is that smaller atoms, they always form stronger bonds. Uh, they would have smaller bond length. They would be closer to each other. There's going to be more orbital overlap. They would attract each other's electrons. More orbital overlap would happen. Tegan, let me show this. We did uh, sigma and pi bonds. So in that case, uh, so let me show you. Sigma and pi bonds. So we did this sigma and pi bonds, and in that we discussed that when an atom bonds, the orbitals are basically being attracted by both atoms. For example, uh, if this one has an has a partially filled orbital, or maybe I'll show you a hydrogen atom. So hydrogen has one electron that's roaming around in a in a spherical orbital. It's it has a very high probability of existing in that area. There's another hydrogen atom. It's got one electron. So both hydrogen atoms need one electron. They both try to pull each other's electrons. What basically happens is that the atoms are small, so they attract each other's electrons very strongly. The electrons are going to get stuck in the middle. Uh, because both atoms are trying to pull on those electrons. I mean, this one this one wants to gain electrons. This other one also wants to gain electrons. So the electrons are kind of stuck right in the middle. Uh, these electrons that, are, that were busy buzzing around over here and this electron over here that was buzzing over here, they will get stuck in the middle because both atoms will be trying to pull on those electrons. So if the atom is small, the nucleus would be less shielded and this nucleus will be attracting the other atoms electrons very very strongly so there's going to be more orbital overlap uh, so whenever a bond is formed there's going to be an orbital overlap like in this case the two fluorine atoms are fighting over electrons like this fluorine needs an electron in the 2pz this other fluorine also has a 2pz that is partially filled it needs an electron over there so they both start attracting each other's electrons and the electrons are going to get stuck in the middle. So if the atom is small, they attract each other's electrons very, very strongly, which is why uh, they're going to form stronger bonds. So covalent bonds, smaller atoms form stronger bonds. They'll have a shorter bond length and there's going to be more orbital overlap. If the atom is bigger, 
uh, they won't de- attract each other's electrons that strongly. So the orbital overlap is going to be a lot lesser. Now, the other type of bond that you have is, uh, is, is an ionic bond or any bond that depends on ions, like metallic bonds also have ions in them. So any bond that depends on ions like NaCl, NaS plus one, Cl is, Cl is minus one. So Na is plus one and you got Cl, which is minus one. Now in an ionic bond, uh, the strength depends on charge density. Uh, again, what is charge density? Charge density is, the first factor still applies over here. Charge density is that you've got a smaller ion. Smaller ions would be closer to each other, so there's going to be more attraction. So it's the same as the first one. Remember, smaller atoms form stronger covalent bonds. Smaller ions also form stronger covalent bo- uh, ionic bonds because they are going to be they are going to be close to each other. And the other factor is the charge on the ion. So ionic bonds have this other factor that determines the strength of the ionic bond. And that is, so it's got two factors. One is, one is the size of the ion and the other one is the charge on the ion. So for example, instead of NaCl, I've got, uh, I've got MgO. So the attraction between the ions is going to be a lot stronger, not because of the size, but mainly because of the extra charge. Plus two and minus two is going to have a much bigger attraction. So remember, uh, bonds that depend on ions, uh, for them, it's charge density, the two factors, the size of the ion and the charge on the ion. They both matter uh, when determining the bond strength. For covalent, uh, it's usually just the uh, size of the atom. Plus, how many electrons are getting shared? So we can talk, we can add this factor, and that is that a single bond is going to be weaker because there are less electrons being shared. A double bond is going to be obviously more stronger. A triple bond is going to be an even stronger bond. So how many electrons being shared? That's also uh, a factor when you determine the strength of the covalent bond. I said, now this one, uh, group 17 elements, chlorine, bromine, and iodine form hydrates. Outline the thermal stabilities of these hydrates. So I've got HCl. I've got HPR. We're moving down the group. And I've got HI. So the thermal stability would, would decrease. why it's going to be a lot, lot easier to break the HI bond. And you're going to uh, talk about a uh, bigger atom and you're going to talk about uh, that it has a bigger bond length and there's less orbital overlap. I mean, this is the, I mean, in the next part you have to explain the variation. So you're going to talk about iodine being the size of the at- iron, sorry, size of the atom increases and then you can talk about this thing, that they're going to have bigger bond length and there's going to be less orbital overlap. TK, is this clear? Anna, is this clear? Aisha, Hani, is this clear? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So, so just remember, okay, uh, so all these questions would be related to strength. Remember about covalent bonds, smaller atoms, ionic bonds, smaller ions they always result in stronger bonds. In ionic compounds, uh, charge is a factor, uh, greater charge as well. That would result in a stronger bond. MGO is like really strong. MGO is considered to be, I mean, its melting point is almost as close to diamond. Diamond is 4,000 degrees centigrade. MGO is like uh, like up there. It's like 3,000 degrees centigrade. NaCl is comparatively a very weak lattice. So, and the same applies to covalent bonds. Uh, this one is about uh, one second. So this one is about uh, aluminium reacting with chlorine to form a white solid uh, chloride that contains seventy nine point seven percent chlorine, 
and sublimes changes straight from solid to a gas at 180 degrees centigrade. Uh, describe the structure and bonding in this compound suggests how it explains the low sublimation temperature. So uh, why does it sublime? That's the question. And uh, it's bonding. So this is all about uh, the thing that we did, which is this one. Where did we do uh, this one second? So right at the end, we did dative bonds. And in dative bonds, we talked about dimerization. And dimerization of AlCl3, two AlCl3 molecules combining to Al form Al2Cl6. Now, what happens is that the melting points, and let me quote the melting points of both. You don't have to remember the melting points. This one is, uh, uh, and is he, has he given the melting point of the timer as well? Just one second. So we're going to talk about uh, its sublimation. Where's the question? I couldn't find the. He's saying that it uh, describes the structure and bonding in its in this compound suggests how it explains the low sublimation temperature. So we only talk about the intermolecular forces, and he's saying that seventy nine point seven percent chlorine. So it's a uh, and it uh, sublimes changes straight from a solid to a gas at one eighty degrees centigrade. First thing is, what type of intermolecular force? I mean, it's got it's got simple covalent bonds. That's one thing. TK, we're going to check uh, the marking scheme for this one, uh, just to confirm, uh, because he's he's very specific. You have to describe the structure and bonding. So uh, I'm just going to check whether we want to talk about the dimer or not in this case. So it's a simple covalent uh, bond. Uh, what type of intermolecular force would it have if you've got two LCL3 molecules? Is this going to be a polar molecule or a non-polar molecule? I mean, the shape is going to be trigonal planar. It's going to be exactly the same that we have drawn over here. Uh, Cl being more electronegative. So Cl is very electronegative. Cl likes to gain electrons. But the thing is that there are three Cls pulling electrons from different directions. And uh, it's a symmetric molecule. That means the forces of attraction are going to get cancelled out. And the dipoles will cancel out. So all the dipoles are going to get canceled out, which means uh, there would be no slight negative or slight positive charge. So there's not going to be any permanent dipole attraction. The other ALCL3 molecule would be kind of exactly the same. There's not going to be any, any dipole. They would all cancel out. Is this point clear? That it's going to be a completely non-polar molecule. Yes or no, is this clear? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes. I just, so if, if a molecule is completely non-polar, then what is the only intermolecular forces that's going to exist in that molecule? I mean, you had three types of intermolecular forces. You had hydrogen bonds, you had permanent dipoles, and you had uh, Van der Waals forces. So what are you going to have in this case? Van der Waals forces. Okay, so this one is going to be Van der Waals forces because Van der Waals forces are always present, but you don't have any hydrogen bonds. Hydrogen bonds are, are an extreme version of a permanent dipole. Same is the case with uh, this one. Uh, permanent dipoles, so there is no dipoles. 
So the only attractive force is going to be the temporary dipole induced dipoles uh, or instantaneous dipoles that are produced. When these molecules randomly bump into each other, sometimes this side would become very slightly negative, this side would become very slightly positive. At another instant during another collision, this side would become slight positive, this side would become slight negative. So there would be just random fluctuating dipoles being created as the electrons get knocked to one side or the other side during a collision. And there would be dipoles induced over here. So this, there would be just Van der Waals forces. And Van der Waals forces are considered to be the weakest out of the three. So which is why it's going to have really weak intermolecular forces. And uh, which is why not a lot of energy is needed to break them. So they break easily. Or you can say less energy is needed, which is why it sublimes. I mean, the attractive forces between them is not going to be very, very strong. TK, is this clear? Yes. And so for this one, I just have a doubt whether they have, are they going to mention anything about dimerization or not? Uh, because it was a simple question. They were just saying why it's got uh, low sublimation temperature. Why sublimation is that it turns into a solid, uh, solid from a solid to a gas directly. So it's W15 QB21, just once again, very, very quickly, 9701. MS21. And this one. I was going to forget this. So this was some part C, uh, uh, this one. So they, were, they weren't actually talking about, uh, I mean, they, they, were, they had, uh, I mean, there was no mention of, of uh, the dimerization part. So you didn't have to use it. It was a simple question. Just talking about the intermolecular forces. What type of intermolecular forces are going to exist between the molecules? So this is just ALCL3. Uh, and dimerization is simply that two ALCL3 molecules at any point can combine with each other to form AL2Cl6. So this other part is all about that. He's saying solid aluminum chloride is heated above 451 calvins. A vapor is formed which has an MR of 267. Uh, usually, ALCL3 has an MR of uh, 133.5. I mean, it's got three CLs. Uh, now it's 267. So that means a dimer has been formed. So vapor is formed, which has, which has an MR of 267. And when it's heated at 1100 Kelvins, the vapor is now has an MR of 133.5. So at 1150, it's going to be ALCL3. And at 460, it's 267. That means it's double two ALCL3s have combined together. And you're looking for the dot and cross diagram of the aluminum chloride that exists at the higher temperature, this one. So that's easy. AL. AL's got three CLs. So you can make your CLs and draw the electrons yourself. And the one that exists, and he's only asking for the displayed formula. So it's just this thing, AL with three CLs and there's another AL with three CLs. So the lone pair of CL is going to be attracted to the aluminum empty orbital and the lone pairs of this CL will be attracted to the empty orbital of the aluminum on this side. So that's about it. Tariq, let's uh, continue tomorrow. Tariq, tomorrow we'll, we'll do a full-fledged pass paper. Uh, and Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, I'll try and uh, I'll give I'll I'll send you the time for the pass paper session. Uh, it's it's probably going to happen at three p.m. Pakistan time, so uh, that's when we're going to start the pass paper session. TK. Okay, everyone, take care. Allah Hafiz. Allah Hafiz. Allah Hafiz. Allah Hafiz. Sir. Allah Hafiz.